So I opened this evening by reflecting about what a long and difficult and unsettling week this has been for all of us who make our spiritual lives in synagogues, especially in synagogues here in Texas. It is remarkable how the short span of these few days finds us so different on this Shabbat than we were last Shabbat, when all of us at one point or another slowly or more rapidly became aware of the news from Congregation Beth Israel and Colleyville. The events in Colleyville represented the third significant act of anti-Semitic terrorism perpetrated against a synagogue in just over the past three years. And thank God, thank God, the ending of this story had a happier ending than the ones in Pittsburgh and Poway. And I want to make sure that we make no mistake, but that this story might very easily have had a similarly tragic ending if it were not for the bravery and the heroism of my friend, Rabbi Charlie Citron Walker. Rabbi Charlie is a hero, and he is a tzaddik, a true righteous soul. If you have read or heard or watched any of the interviews with him over the last week, you know what all of his friends have known for years, that his leadership and his calm and reassuring presence showed the Jewish community what it means to be a rabbi and what it means to be a mensch. During the hours of the hostages' captivity inside their synagogue, the whole Jewish world was gripped with fear and uncertainty. It felt personally like I was holding my breath the whole time. And I know a lot of you felt the same way too. People all across the Jewish community throughout the full spectrum of denominations and affiliations felt worry and fear, anxiety and rage. And yet for all of those feelings, I noticed that very few people felt surprised. To know that there are those out in the world who wish us harm is sobering, but not surprising. This is a sadly familiar feature of the Jewish experience, whose roots extend all the way back, perhaps all the way back to the Torah, perhaps to the same section of the book of Exodus, which we have just finished reading this week. This week, the story shares the account of the biblical Israelites' greatest enemy, a shadowy character called Amalek, who appears periodically throughout the Bible to wreak havoc on Israel by attacking fiendishly and brutally by targeting the slowest and weakest members among the Israelite tribes as they wander through the desert. The existence of those who wish harm and wage violence against the Jewish people is intimately familiar to all of us. And it goes all the way back to Amalek. May his name be erased. But then a funny thing happens in the Torah portion. Almost immediately after Amalek's bloody attack on the Israelites comes the climactic pinnacle of the entire book. Perhaps the high point of the entire Torah, when in this week's Torah portion, Parshat Yitro, as our bat mitzvahs can tell you, when in this portion, our ancestors receive the words of God's Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. It's interesting, isn't it, that those two stories are conjoined like that. The horror of Amalek's violence gingerly abutting the awesome power of the revelation at Sinai. Why is that? Why should the story be built in such a peculiar way? In part, I think that the jarring nature of the structure comes as a reminder that we have a choice between a couple of different approaches, an option to see the world through one frame or another, through the threat of Amalek or the promise of Sinai. Sometimes we select this frame over here through which we are able to recognize and focus on the threats that face us from the outside. In this mode, we're able to make clear and decisive 
tactical decisions about what to do based on the undisputed reality that some people want to do us harm because of who we are. And sometimes we choose this frame over here. In this other mode, this Mount Sinai mode, we find ourselves open to transcendence, open to the eternal possibility of receiving truth and guidance, to connecting with God in an intimate mode of deepest connection and holy vulnerability. And all of us at one time or another toggle between one frame and the other, shifting at times from one organizational view and the other in our quest to understand who we are and what God expects of us. In its most accurate form, the story of Jewish life includes the very real and very threatening presence of Amalek. We have a commitment to keeping that story alive and perpetuating the memory of every time someone outside our ranks has sought our destruction. All of this is stamped in the DNA of Jewish life. That at one point or another, every choice to let someone in from the outside entails some measure of risk, a vulnerability in the system which may lead to our peril. We remember the stories of our people, from Baghdad to Berlin, from Sevilla to Squirrel Hill. Every time we were dehumanized and abused, dispossessed and slaughtered. And our duty as Jews is to ensure with our lives that those who suffered before us did not do so in vain. Now, when that is the frame through which we view our place in history, we can never shift out of it into Sinai mode unless and until we feel safe from the threat that awaits us outside. Not until we feel secure can we inhabit a Jewish life open to Torah, open to growth, open to faith and inspiration, and connectedness with what is holy. We can't pray or learn if we're not safe. We can't focus on our chosen spiritual tasks when we're worried about who might force their way in to this sacred space to do us harm. So it seems as though we are faced with a dialectic, a choice between these two components of this story, Amalek on one hand and Sinai on the other, a choice between two modes in which we may live our Jewish lives. But the more I thought about it this week, the more I came to the conclusion that there really is no choice here at all. These two stories, Amalek and Sinai, are placed side by side in a position of equal sanctity in our holiest text. Both of them real, both of them unavoidable, neither of which can be ignored or removed from the realities of Jewish life. We can't live always and, and only in the rarefied air of Sinai, consumed single-mindedly with the needs and obligations of our own community, holy though they may be, and we can't live forever hiding from the pursuit of the murderous Amalek, that the threat he represents is very real. If our view of Jewish life constricts so tightly that through it we can only see the splendor of Sinai or only the hatred of Amalek, we will be weakening and impoverishing the greatness of the Jewish national experience by making it into an idol fashioned in our own image. These two pieces of our national story are connected and they are interdependent, not just thematically, but also narratively. There's something that connects the two, a thin filament of connective tissue that binds the story of Amalek with the story of Sinai and the giving of the commandments. And that filament is found in the story of Yitro the man for whom this week's Torah portion is named. Yitro is Moses' father-in-law. And at the beginning of this portion, just before the people make their way to the mountain where they will hear God's word revealed amid thunder and lightning, Yitro approaches the Israelite encampment and asks to be let in. He's come to visit Moses, he says, and he asks to be admitted to the great man's tent. Something you have to know about Yitro is that he's not an Israelite. 
he's a Midianite, he's an outsider. He doesn't share Moses' religious traditions or his ethical code. He's not one of us. And yet, when he arrives at the place where Moses is camped for the night, while Israel is still recuperating from the bloody damage inflicted on them by Amalek, he comes to Moses' tent and Moses greets him. They bow to each other and embrace, and Yitro is granted entrance to the tent. Moses had to have known that this was a risk. He must have been keenly aware so soon after the battle with Amalek that the safest posture for him to assume would have been one of reinforcement and defense in which his vulnerable entrances and exits were solidly closed off to outsiders. But Moses opened the door and embraced Yitro and brought him inside. Why, why would he do that? Hadn't he learned anything from the encounter with Amalek? It is a confounding question. And it is the same one that puzzled every journalist and interviewer that I heard this week, who landed in Colleyville and asked Rabbi Charlie, would you do it again? Would you open that door again next time to an unfamiliar and foreign looking stranger to offer him a cup of tea and the space to get warm on a cold Shabbos morning? And every time they asked him without hesitation, he said, yes, yes, of course I would. Because hospitality and kindness and openness are at the root of the Jewish experience and the Jewish conscience. To refuse kindness and hospitality is to spurn our birthright, to reject the values that make us who we are. Of course, he would open the door a second time. And maybe that was the same reasoning our ancestors used. All those millennia ago when they were encamped in the wilderness of Zin, near the mountain called Sinai. Perhaps they made the same calculation and arrived at the same conclusion when Yitro, unfamiliar and imposing, arrived at the outskirts of their camp. It may have seemed as though they had a choice to turn him away and send him back into the dark night alone, but they didn't have a choice, not really. Because if they were to accept the invitation to serve as God's people, animated by a commitment to compassion and generosity, of course, they had to let him in. And who knows, maybe that decision, maybe that deliberate move toward openness and hospitality with which they welcomed Yitro to the warmth of the cooking fires in the Israelite camp, maybe that was the gesture that convinced God to offer the most bountiful and generous gift ever offered to this fledgling people, the gift of Torah. Perhaps that brief hovering moment, that vanishingly short instant in which Moses made the choice between yes and no, between open-heartedness and hard-heartedness, maybe that was the thing that beckoned God down onto that mountain to present him with the Ten Commandments to codify Jewish morality and Jewish justice. This past Monday was Tu Bishvat. You might remember the holiday from your Sunday school days. It's the birthday of the trees, the often overlooked holiday that functions like a Jewish Arbor Day, the day that we give thanks for the natural world to celebrate the endless cycles of renewal of trees and plants and nuts and fruit. When the spring arrives and the pale green filaments of new life emerge from the earth, we are reminded that every moment of growth came from a seed's rupture. Every new fruit was once a tiny coil of DNA locked tightly in the vault of that seed. The most critical component of that plant's survival secured away behind a hard protective shell, but there would be no future for the plant unless the seed cracks open ever so slightly so that it can be nourished and warmed and so it can grow. Our holiest text places the stories of Amalek and Sinai side by side. 
and their juxtaposition reminds us that both experiences are real and neither can be removed from the reality of Jewish life without doing violence to the truth of our tradition. It is the promise of Sinai, the belief that law and goodness will be the prevailing forces that save us. That cautions us not to hide ourselves away from the outside world and convince ourselves that everyone out there wishes to see us destroyed. They do not. And we cannot allow our trauma to blind us to the potential in God's world. We have to allow ourselves to crack open ever so slightly, so the light can penetrate and we can grow into who we were meant to become. This Shabbat, this holiest of days, we read about Moses' ascent to Mount Sinai, where he receives the tablets of the law and prepares to lead his people to the fulfillment of their moral mission as God's people. But Sinai is not an escape from the violence and difficulty of real life. Sinai orders us to forge our future in the real world and insists that we must find a way to live in fellowship with those different from ourselves, though doing so opens ourselves up to the possibility of struggle and pain. Sinai demands a certain humble openness to the possibility of religious awakening, which we can only attain if we are willing to step ever so slightly away from paranoia and fear. On this Shabbat, we give thanks for God's grace, which preserved the congregation in Colleyville. We remember again to mourn for those who have been victimized by violence. We are reminded again to disdain the memory of those who wished harm upon us. And we commit ourselves again to rebuilding and the place where we will rebuild is the place from which we can see the promised land, the high space atop a mountain, where God's word meets our willingness to grow. Shabbat shalom, everyone.